So firstly, we have got Bill Winters, Group CEO uh, of Standard Chartered. Bill, love to have you on the, the program. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Me. Dr. Lucas Jopper, Chief Environmental Officer for Microsoft. Lucas, welcome. Thank it you. Is, it's a bit hot in here, I'm afraid, but we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> and Ruth Peratt, SVP and Chief Financial Officer from Alphabet and Google. Ruth, welcome. Thank, Thank you so you. much for your time. And Graham Pitt-Kethley, Chief Financial Officer at Unilever. Graham. Welcome, thank, thank you very much for joining us. So we are going to have a, a half an hour discussion about technology, the innovation that we're seeing uh, and how innovation and technology is the key to unlocking that just transition to emerging markets and importantly, how we're going to finance that. So Bill, I'm gonna start with you first. If you can set us the scene, because I know that you have been passionate about this for many years, about ensuring a, a just transition for emerging markets. I think 2060 is the, is the framework, isn't it, here? So what does innovation mean for you in the context of getting those economies to net zero? Yeah, maybe the most important thing is that, uh, like in so many other areas of technology that, that my co-panelists are better qualified to talk about than I am, the emerging markets have a chance to leapfrog. So the, the emerging market economies can develop carbon efficient or, or carbon neutral or maybe even carbon extractive technologies uh, in, in a way that, that would not have been possible in, in earlier generations. So that's, you know, that's the good news, that there are opportunities to, to develop an, an industrial and a post-industrial base in a carbon efficient way. Uh, the challenge is money. Uh, the challenge is getting the funds into the, into the hands of people that can really make the most difference. And I'm sure we'll be talking about where the, where the money can come from. But the, the, the opportunities for innovation in emerging markets are, are really unlimited. Uh, in terms of, of deploying uh, the technology that we know exists in other parts of the world or that is being developed uh, first into emerging markets. Uh, but the, the, there's a flip side of that as well, which is, is, which is a whole verification question. So yeah, the, there's, there are the, the, the biggest carbon sinks in the world today are in emerging markets. Uh, we know that they're in Latin America and in Central Africa and, and uh, in Southeast Asia. And the, the, one of the very substantial impediments to getting money into the hands of, of the people who can actually protect those existing carbon sinks is verification. And the technology, and I'm sure that Ruth uh, and, and probably Graham as well, uh, will be talking about this, uh, the, 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 the power of, of technology and innovation to, to provide assurance to the money, right? Insurance to the people that are funding this uh, is, is unmatched in history and, and I think could be a great enabler. Well, you're in luck today because we have three of the most innovative companies probably on the planet joining us on the panel. Of course, we've got Microsoft, Alphabet and Google and Unilever. Um, influential and innovative, absolutely. So Lucas, let, let's come to you first. Um, Microsoft is known to be at the intersection, isn't it, of technology and also the climate. Mm. So to tell us about innovation and technological innovation and what does it mean to you in the context of net zero, particularly with emerging markets? Yeah, for us, it, it really means two things. First and foremost, it means actually building the technologies for carbon reduction and removal that we need to get to a net zero carbon economy by 2050. So we've got to go from making pledges to actually delivering on our promises and making progress. The second thing that's critical to not just building them, but actually getting them deployed is reducing that green premium that we see across all sorts of carbon reduction removal technologies. And so getting that green premium down to parity or below for, uh, for this kind of sector all up is going to be critical. The good news is in some areas, we're already seeing that renewable energy outcompetes on an economic basis, hydrocarbon heavy energy in many places in many parts of the day. But then we have other critical technologies that we're absolutely going to have to rely on, like carbon removal and things like direct air capture, where the green premium is sky high because there isn't even anything to compare it to. So we have a lot of work to do, but finance is sitting right at the center of how that innovation is going to happen. Yeah. And Ruth, let's bring you in now because your company literally touches billions of users every day. You have an enormous amount of, of power there. So what, what are you seeing in terms of um, innovation and, and what does it mean to you when you're deploying or making that transition to net zero? Well, given the importance of really helping all of our partners address the threat of climate change, we have a host of different efforts underway. Given our mission, it's about organizing the world's information. One core part is helping partners. So we established, to your question, a goal by the end of this year to help one billion people on the planet make smarter decisions every day about that affect the climate. Um, and affect the planet. So, How for example, you? yeah, if you're doing, if you're going to search for travel routes, you look for your plane options, flight options, you'll see carbon footprint for the various options. If you want to get from point A to point B, we'll give you eco-friendly routes and show you a different route that may be a bit longer, but actually substantially more carbon efficient. We're looking to do that and embed that in every choice. Why? Because we see that people want it and it's the right thing for the planet. 
The other is we're working with our enterprise customers, and Graham and I have spent a lot of time on this because Unilever's been extraordinary. We have mapped the planet through Google Earth Engine. And when you combine that data with data analytics and AI, we can work with amazing partners like Unilever and look through the supply chain at things like deforestation. And you can have real-time data. So access to data so that people can manage it is one core, core part. The other is we've made a commitment ourselves to run on carbon-free energy. We've been carbon neutral since 07. We then went to match 100% of energy consumption with renewables. And now we're focused on becoming carbon-free energy 24-7, all of our data centers by 2030, and looking to be carbon neutral through net zero through our supply chain thereafter. And so all of the work we have to do to invest globally so that you can actually run data centers 24-7 on carbon-free energy is a critical part of what we're doing so we can deliver on that promise and then all of our partners are able to operate on a green cloud. Very impressive. I mean, you, all, your, all your targets are very impressive. And Graham, Graham, let's bring you in now. I mean, you manage an, in, a very, very complex supply chain. I think you've got, what, over 400 household names uh, mm -hmm. in terms of products that, that you're, you're selling as Unilever. So how do you go about innovating that supply chain? Of course, if there's partnerships as well, so you can meet the, the Paris Agreement and tell us about your goals. I mean, it is a bit bewildering at times, actually, yeah. the scale of the company. Do you forget how many products you sell? Absolutely, and, and <laughs> always have to apologise for forgetting which brands in which, in which market, etc. It takes about five years to, to actually learn the company, to be honest. But um, it's a really, really global enterprise and a really, really big supply chain uh, and a big value network. Um, we procure about 20 billion of um, raw materials uh, and commodities every single year. And we do that in 150 countries in the world. So it's, 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 you know, it's big and it's got scale. But the first thing that we did was to publish a climate transition action plan. And we did that um, about this time last year. It was probably about 14 months ago. And we, you know, that for me was, the, was a real coming together of all the actions that we're going to take within the company. And just to share a couple of those with you, I mean, um, obviously, we're going to be net zero by, in our case, 2039 is the commitment. But we set a number of milestones along the way, and we'll continue to adapt those milestones because the sort of big end goal, you know, could be anything. To be honest, you really have to be granular about how you're going to get there. Um, within our actual GHG footprint, um, about 50% of it is in raw materials and packaging materials. Uh, interestingly, 10% of it is in ice cream cabinets. We have a, an estate of 3 million ice cream cabinets around the world. 3 million? Supplying, supplying magnums. It's a lot of ice cream, cherries. huh? It's a lot of ice cream, but the <laughs> ice cream travels in a cold chain of minus 18 degrees. And we think if we can obviously make those cabinets green and we think if we can uh, innovate to reduce the temperature at which ice cream can, can, can exist within its value chain, its supply chain, um, you know, we could reduce the, the, the footprint by up to 30%. So they're examples yeah. of the sort of things. There's, there's other areas of innovation. We have 20% um, of the businesses are home care business. We use a lot of carbon-based surfactant within that. Um, we're doing lots of work with um, all of our chemical suppliers to find ways of using carbon that is um, renewable or recyclable. That's carbon that comes from things like algae or atmospheric carbon, et cetera. And that, that is integral to the strategy of our home care business that we call Clean Future. So there's lots and lots of things going on, but um, actually the, 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 the scale of our supply chain or our value chain is one of the, it's not a complexity, it's actually an advantage, I think. Yep. Okay, so we talked, that great innovation is happening. Um, let's talk about how we're gonna finance that, because I think you said before, 30% of technology is, is still not invented yet in order to get emerging markets in particular to net zero. And you've, you've come up with this incredible number, at 94.8 trillion US dollars. I mean, that is eye-watering, isn't it, in terms of, if you look at global GDP, is needed for emerging markets alone just to transition in a fair way to net zero. So what is the role in, in, in finance, your world, funding those innovations? You know, we, we have to tackle this in, in a number of different ways. So the, uh, there are some projects that are economic in their own right. Uh, so, so thankfully, much of the renewal, renewable power that's being produced today is economic, and it can be delivered in, in relatively small scale or large scale in emerging economies. That's going full speed, and that's, uh, that's obviously a very good thing. Uh, there are some things that, that simply aren't financeable. Uh, on purely economic grounds, and uh, those typically involve some, some complicated construction risks or substantial political risk, which is obviously very common in, uh, in many of the, the markets where we operate in developing markets of the world. It's an issue in some developed markets as well. The, uh, the, the gap between the amount of money that's ready to be invested in sustainability 
on the one hand, and the amount that's prepared to be invested in emerging markets is huge. So if you're in Europe, you can get about 80% of your sustainable, your renewable power investments finance through conventional means without any help from anybody other than the private sector. You get to sub-Saharan Africa, it's less than 10%. So the only way to, to crack that nut is to bring together the, the public sector and the private sector in a partnership that's both collaborative and highly leveraged. Uh, so we look to the World Bank, the uh, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, the Africa Development Bank, et, et cetera, to come together with, with banks, with capital markets, uh, with, in some cases, some philanthropic funds, although that's definitionally limited in terms of scale, and bring together projects that, uh, that are financeable at a, at, a, at a local level. And I think with the, right, with the right cooperation, the money is there. It's just a matter of catalyzing it to get it into the right place. And uh, I think the public-private partnerships are going to be one key way to get there. And then investing in this is the, the rest of our panel will, will be very focused on, on the ways that we can scale technologies so that they actually become efficient for developing economies so that we don't need any kind of subsidy, financial or otherwise. But that's a, you know, that, that's a, a to-be-developed, I think, set of opportunities. Lucas, come in. Well, I think, you know, a lot of people ask me, how do you, you know, how do you get started in, in your net zero journey? That's kind of the most t popular question I get in Davos. And, and I'm always like, well, you just get started. And well, how do you get started? And generally, it means you start spending money. Uh, and, and you start looking at how you're going to meet your 2030 targets. We, back in 2020, said we were going to be a carbon negative company, reduce our emissions by half or more, physically remove the rest from the atmosphere. So how are we going to do that? Mm. And what, how are we going to mature the markets that we're going to need for us and the rest of the world to meet our goals? We said there's basically three levers. If you want to mature markets, you can be a customer, an investor, or in a donor. And we said we're going to be all three. Yeah. So we Because you have a, a lot of cash on your balance sheet. Yeah, so I, I mean, a little bit less after we buy all this carbon uh, removal. <laughs> but. Um, you know, we, we have an internal carbon fee. It's a real fee, it's not a shadow fee. Yep. We actually collect this money as revenue. And that allows us, in 2020, it allowed us to become the largest purchaser of carbon removal in the history of the world. So that helps stimulate demand in the market. We also put together a billion dollar climate innovation fund that yep. lets us go out and invest in these technologies that aren't as mature as necessarily renewable energy. And get those up and running at scale, then we can become customers of those investments as well. And then we recognize that there are needs out there in the market that don't fit the current kind of, they need almost hero capital. And we went together with a whole bunch of other or companies and organization called Catalyst and donated $100 million to lower the CapEx costs of green hydrogen, long duration storage, direct air capture, and sustainable aviation fuel manufacturing. So we're trying to cover all the financial bases that we possibly can to mature these markets. But our experience is that it's going to take way more than Microsoft, no matter how much cash at hand. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, Google's in this space, Unilever's in this space, yeah. Standard Chartered. We need all of us coming together, spending our money in all the ways that we can to get yeah. these markets to where they're going to have Ruth, to go. You're, you're nodding, so, so come in. And also tell us, if you don't mind, about, because I know you do a lot of investment as well within Alphabet and Google. Right. So what are your, your financial parameters when you're looking to make an investment, trying maybe to make a return or not make a return? What, what are you looking for? Well, I think that was very well stated because it does require all of us to do our part and more to actually move the needle in the speed needed given where the planet is today. One of the interesting points for me was when we made a commitment back in 2017 that we would match 100% of our energy consumption with renewables, we thought it would take us quite some time because that was not available. And what you would be, learn in kind of basic econ supply demand, if we indicate that much demand, it should increase price. But actually what it did is it gave clarity to the market and it stimulated development and therefore supply. And so we've been able to match our energy consumption in a shorter period of time and more economically because we disclosed and set out this long-term goal. And I think those types of efforts coupled with venture investing, we're doing it as well. We're doing it in part mm -hmm. partnerships with others as an example. We recently participated in a new venture called Frontier with Stripe and mm -hmm. others. And the focus is to stimulate investment and innovation in carbon capture. And what we did there is we said, and to the extent these look like they have potential, we will be a customer. So again, making it really clear that you need innovation, but you also need market. 
and that's what we can provide. So we're looking at it a host of different ways. I talked about some of them. We have a host of other investments that we're making in what we call our Moonshot Factory X. Your Moonshot Factory. <laughs> and and, and as about we have that. said the biggest moonshot actually is the planet. And so we're looking at things like carbon capture, as Microsoft is, as well. We're looking at what we can do with oceans, what we can do with agriculture, but we're experimenting in a number of ways. And when you ask about returns, you know, it varies. It's, there's a whole spectrum of it, as there should be. Um, Graham, let's bring you in now. Of course, you have a, a big footprint around the world, including mm. many emerging markets. Do you have any good examples that you, you can give us of innovation on the ground using partnerships and tech and, and any learnings you have? Yeah, I mean, I really just want to underscore what Ruth said about yeah. the power of partnership. And Lucas, you touched on it as well. I mean, it's, it, it, it's fundamentally important to do this in conjunction with the, with the system in which you're operating. And also, I mean, the partnerships that we've got going at the moment they're most effective i mean the scale of our supply chain uh, allows us to take our commitments and to um share that with our suppliers for them to set their own sbti commitments and, and therefore you sort of get this leverage and scale effect coming off your own com commitments and that, that i mean we're all looking for impact at the end of the day particularly regarding carbon so so you know using the ability to lever that up a little bit is is, um, is a great thing to do. Uh, but when it comes to partnerships around technology, there's some really exciting things happening. I mean, what we do, Ruth mentioned it earlier, but what we do with, uh, with Google is around deforestation. We're one of the biggest buyers of palm and soy in the world. And for years, we've, we've been um, at the forefront of trying to make that supply chain responsible uh, and renewable, but also to make it traceable. And it's the traceable part where technology comes in. And what, uh, what, what we do with uh, Google and our company called Orbital on, um, first of all, using uh, Android technology to be able to see all the way from the mill where, where palm oil is, you know, comes off the plantations, goes to the mill, to trace that all the way back to the plantation it came from. And then using geostat technology and mapping to be able, and AI to be able to look at, well, what is actually happening to the, to the forest itself? Has it come from the place that we thought it came from? And over time, it, is that actually you know, being renewed? Is it being deforested or is it not being deforested? You can only answer those questions with technology. It's really remarkable and it gives us all of this. I mean, frankly, we, we, we wouldn't have known how to crack that nut prior to a partnership. And building on that, we're really excited about what Google Earth Engine can do for everyone and helping them understand carbon footprint. So as an example, we similarly are leveraging this mapping of the planet. And we said, how can policymakers in cities around the globe understand their carbon footprint from the built environment and from transit so that they can actually think about the type of policy intervention that's needed? So at this point, we're up to 20,000 cities and jurisdictions. And it's a tool that they can use. And it's fascinating to see what's happened over time and what does it mean for policymakers? Yeah, well, let's talk about policymakers or, or, or the framework needed for investors to feel more confident or de-risk to, to get that money flowing from the north to the south, which you've talked about so well before, Bill. Well, what needs to happen then to increase those financial flows? Well, for, from a, from a policymaking perspective, I think maybe the, <clears throat> the the biggest thing is to have an understood set of standards yep. that uh, that we, we all know that we're shooting at. Uh, as it is right now, if you have a company like Microsoft or Google or maybe even Standard Chartered or Unilever, uh, we can afford to have a whole team of people who are out assessing projects on a project-by-project -project basis. Uh, but that's not available to most companies mm -hmm. and no individuals can, can do that, that level of due diligence. So getting to the point, if, if we're talking about a multi-trillion dollar industry here, which is you know, protecting the planet, which we are, uh, we have to have some standards that can allow people to make investments without having to do their own homework, to, to be confident that the... That the, uh, that the goods are, are being delivered as, as promised. Uh, and obviously that would rely on a lot of the, the exactly the technology that uh, the Microsoft and Google are, are deploying. So, I mean, it's, it's all part of an ecosystem. Uh, and that's a, a lot of what, what, uh, what I've been doing, what we've been doing at Standard Chartered has, has been to, to help set those standards. Now we've done that in the context of carbon credits uh, to make the offset market a, a more uh, visible, more transparent, much higher quality and better governed market. And we're in the process of doing that. I think it's gonna be very successful. Uh, but it's not just about carbon credit, it's about, it's about the, the projects themselves, and it's about the actual transition pathway to a zero carbon economy, uh, a zero economy, a zero carbon manufacturing processes. Uh, having a, a, an understanding of what's, what's achievable and how are you delivering against what's achievable. Right? So organizations like the Science-Based Target Initiative have become policy setters as a practical matter because they're setting the, or the International Energy Agency, they're setting pathways for the rest of us to follow. 
Uh, and they're effectively taking the role of, of, of a policymaker because that's the standard that we have to meet uh, in the rest of the economy in order to say we're doing the right thing. I've heard that so many times today in terms of the need of re regulation in a policy framework, and we're only in the first day of Davos, aren't we? So, is this, is this on your to-do list when you talk to you know, policymakers? Is this what you're really banging the drum about? Our number one ask is for clarity. Yeah. I think we talk about the three Ms, the meaning, the measurement, and the markets behind net zero. Yeah. We need significantly greater clarity in all three of them if we're going to make progress. We know what net zero means at an atmospheric global scale. We need to know what it means at an organizational scale, not in a voluntary way, but in a policy-driven way. The measurement of carbon, how are we actually going to measure yeah. and then report out carbon? And then the markets, we need much more clarity. We happen to think that strong, clear prices on carbon would be a fantastic way to drive some clarity on the market. But you know, in the US, things like 45Q to actually provide some subsidization for carbon removal technologies, et cetera, et cetera. We just need to put that clarity. Standards are a great way to start. And then let the private sector do what it does best okay. and start innovating. We think we're both CFOs as well. So this must be way up your list as well. Ruth, what, would you, what, are you, what kind of conversations are you hoping to have in Davos? I completely agree. I think it's clarity and consistency and therefore accountability. And so at the end of the day, being required to report in a consistent manner, I think will put pressure on everyone to raise the bar on themselves. And it's proven time and time again that disclosure and quality disclosure is imperative. So I would agree with the comments already made. Okay. And when you're talking to shareholders, Graham, is this something that they raise? Yeah, um, yeah, increasingly, although it's patchy depending on which part of the world you're having that conversation, but generally, across the piece. It's, uh, it's, it's a conversation that there is. You know, I, I might give you um, I don't, the grumpy Scottish accountant Go on. view on this for a second. Well, I had the privilege to be part of the task force on climate-related financial disclosures right from the get-go. And I have to say that a huge amount of work was done by a great group of people there. And frankly, the outcome surpassed all of our expectations. And it's now become the sort of bedrock framework that uh, has been picked up and used around the world. And that's fantastic. So you're not going to hear me say that um, disclosure isn't the right thing to do and consistency is the right thing to do because that's the thing that, as Ruth said, drives change. The behavior happens when you're disclosing it. You won't hear me arguing against that. I am just slightly worried that the, um, the, the, the number of well-intended and, and, and you know, very, very detailed proposals around the world, whether it's in the US with the SEC or in Europe with FRAG or with the ISSB, from the perspective of a preparer, and remember, we're a very well-resourced preparer, and we, we could deliver anything. I'm not going to say we couldn't get it done, but we don't represent, as, as Bill said, the vast majority of companies in the real economy. Mm -hmm. We have to do something that raises the floor and is accessible for everybody. So we have to go at a pace that achieves real change. And the first thing I would plead for in that is convergence of the standards, simplicity of the standards, focus on what really matters. Don't try and politicize it. Don't try and outgun each other with, with who's got the best framework. And if you can't converge, then provide reciprocity so that companies that operate in more than one jurisdiction can, 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 uh, can, can just do it once. Is that being heard? Are you being heard? Well, I've been talking about it all day, and I saw <laughs> chairs of all four of the big four today, so certainly uh, I'm working on it. Um, I want to ask just a couple of quick questions, if you don't mind. I, I listened to a really interesting conversation this morning from a gentleman who's got the, the world's biggest, he was still a small company, but a drone company, who um, went to developed countries, they weren't interested, went to Rwanda and Ghana, they were very interested, and now he's transporting um, blood, at supplies and medical supplies by drones across Rwanda and in rural Ghana. Uh, and now he's developing it around, around the world. And it, of course, that's a leapfrog technology. And, and he said to me, you know, emerging markets don't think that they're a backwater. There's actually huge amounts of innovation and technology there. It's just about getting it to scale. Um, do you see them as, as fertile grounds for innovation to you, Lucas and, and Ruth? Well, I would, yeah. absolutely. I mean, emerging economies represent one of the most obvious places for leapfrog technologies to yeah. actually happen. You know, leapfrog technologies are hard to conjure uh, in any markets, um, and particularly there are barriers to doing so in emerging markets. But we get to see that opportunity of saying there isn't this status quo of how things are done that you have to fight against. So you just have to fight against how are we going to get it done and can this technology scale? I often find it's the, you know, it's it's not the 
it's the scale part that, that we struggle with because of the resources in those, in those economies, whether that's the financing or the infrastructure, but at least it's not two things that you're fighting. You're not fighting the status quo and the scale. Yeah, and on the issue of um, commercialization, do you want to come in, sorry, Ruth? I very much agree. Yeah. I think that if you go back many years, we would have not seen as much exported from emerging yeah. developing markets to the developed world, but just take something like payments. There was such an innovation in Bill's world and financial services and payments that the rest of the world really learned from that. And I would say that in many other areas, they're similarly at leapfrogging. Yeah. We made a billion dollar commitment you know, across Africa last, I think it was last year. We built an AI center as well. We're looking at extraordinary talent and the opportunity to think about what are specific problems that are early warnings for the rest of us mm -hmm. where we can really dive in and make a difference. You want to add, Kamen? Yeah, I, I, just, I think this, this is a really powerful point. And your example is an excellent one because I think, I think we have to remind ourselves that many times innovation is born out of necessity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the reason that that drone, and we're dealing with a number of these guys, distributing vaccines, yep. uh, distributing drugs, uh, the reason that, that they're there is because there was no practical way to get these, these goods and materials into the bush uh, or out into the, into the jungle. Uh, and drones are, are able to do that. So, so we've got a technology that, that is working brilliantly, right? absolutely brilliantly, uh, that will be applied back into, into the developed world, probably with different applications, uh, but the technology will have been refined. In, in a market where it was born purely out of necessity, not, yeah. not out of a desire to be innovative or to make money. And it's great that developed markets are learning from developing, isn't it, once in a while. We are, we are sadly running out of time for this section of the panel. So just to wrap, I just want to ask each and every one of you, if you don't mind, Graham, I'll start with you. Um, the title of this, this session is obviously about um, a, a just transition and financing innovation uh, to net zero. Of course, we've got our next COP meeting in Egypt, so it's very much towards emerging markets. So what do you think needs to happen to get that just transition? Um, well, two or three things. In a, in I, a nutshell. I think, that, I think the commitments that were made by uh, the developed world towards the developing world, just where we finished the last conversation, the first thing is they have to be met. It's kind of unacceptable that they're commitments get made that don't get met. That wouldn't happen in the corporate world and it shouldn't happen in the, uh, in the political and government world. Um, and, and the second thing I'd say is, as we're coming out of the pandemic and enormous resources are being released into economies, if that can be done in a way that is, uh, in a green way, in a way that, 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 that hastens the, the transition, that would be great as well. Put the two things together. Ruth, what would you say? I agree and I'm gonna take a slightly different um, tangent. When we look at the food security threat today, in part because of the war in Ukraine, in part because of climate change. It's a, it is a deep concern. It's a humanitarian issue that we all need to be focused on. We're also doing work in our moonshot factory on this topic. But I would say absolutely agree with the comments about funding and financing and a just transition in our role. But I also want to make sure that on the agenda is the question of food security and the linkage to this, mm -hmm. this pressing problem around climate action. Okay, thank you. Lucas? Ditto. The money has to be released. The financing has to actually happen. And then just going back to the, the last conversation, focusing that on the leapfrog technology, the leapfrog opportunities yeah. to say, we don't have to go through the path to get where we need to go. We can just go there straight away. As long as the money's there, then we know we have the technology and innovation to get us there. And Bill? Uh, all, of, all of the above, but I, I, I would, I found in Glasgow there was a, a, uh, a willingness to allow business to demonstrate what it can do. And I know if you've heard from, from this panel, some of the incredible things that, that business is doing to advance the cause. Uh, governments are doing a lot as well, but I, I, sometimes I think we look through each other, look past each other. Great. So a, a, taking uh, Egypt and then, uh, and then beyond as an opportunity to, to cement that partnership between a business and the private sector, okay. a business and the public sector would be my... And Bob, you, you've got the, the bad luck that you're going to stay with me for the next 15 minutes. So you you <laughs> stay pleasure. there, but it just gives me great pleasure to say thank you thank so you. much thank to you. Graham, Ruth and thank Lucas. You. Thank you. So a big thank round of applause, please. Thank you very much.